Uh, good morning, ladies and gentlemen, and thank you, Barbara, for inviting me uh, to speak here this morning. The heart of Neolithic Orkney World Heritage Site, some of the most iconic prehistoric monuments of Britain, Europe, perhaps even beyond. The Ring of Brodga, the Stones of Stoness, Scarabray, Maze Howe, which over the years have attracted a huge amount of interest, some may say too much interest, ranging from antiquarian investigations to some less welcome forms of attention uh, to more modern forms of excavation such as Colin Renfrew's work there in the 1970s which has recently been augmented and revisited by uh, Colin Richards and Jane Downs with their excavations in 2008 at the Ring of Brodga. And up to date Historic Scotland's work recording through laser scanning the World Heritage Site. But in many ways, despite all this attention, uh, the landscape context of these structures has really changed very little. Here we see uh, the plan of the World Heritage Area produced by Graham Ritchie in association with his uh, excavations at the Stones of Stoness. And in many ways, that plan had hardly changed at all in 120 years when the area was first systematically surveyed by uh, Captain Thomas back in 1850. And it wasn't really until Colin Richard's work in the World Heritage Area and the dis discovery of the Barn House settlement back in the late 1980s and the uh, excavations in the early 1990s did this landscape context setting really become addressed. But it was the designation of the World Heritage Area back in uh, 1999 and uh, the subsequent uh, production of the research agenda that things really began to be looked at in more detail. And this has taken many forms from the Royal Commission's aerial photography of the area that's produced some amazing results. Uh, here, for instance, a new enclosure uh, just beyond the Ring of Buchan to Caroline Wickham-Jones and Sue Dawson's work looking at the changing sea levels both in the coast around Orkney and in the neighbouring locks of Stoness and Harry that surround the World Heritage Site. But perhaps the most illuminating aspect of this work has been the geophysics programme that was instigated back in 2002 and is still ongoing looking at the landscape around the World Heritage Sites. And although we knew that the geophysics was, the, the geology of Orkney was very susceptible to producing excellent geophysics results, I think the results that have been produced have just been quite outstanding. And uh, this work is still ongoing and hot off the presses is the area at the north end of the World Heritage Area, which, as you'll see, has produced a number of new sites. Here, for instance, uh, the two or the enclosure which had been picked up by the Royal Commission, plus another one behind it, a couple of new settlements, Barrow, lots of late medieval rig and furrow, and there we have the Ring of Brooking uh, being geophysed too. And uh, here's just a few examples of uh, what's, uh, the, what the geophysics have uh, found here, for instance, the area around the stones of Stoness. You can forget about these large green anomalies, these are geological in nature, uh, large igneous dikes, but there you can see the stones of Stoness and Barn House settlement beside it, which has now been shown to extend probably quite the way along the shore of the Lockahari. The Brock of Big Howe, supposedly totally removed back in the 1920s, but still surviving uh, as a large geophysical anomaly. The area around Scarabray, which uh, most interestingly has shown that Scarabray itself is much larger than uh, was, uh, has been excavated. Uh, other features, another brock, totally unknown about, piers of Bronze Age houses, probably barrows, and again, lots of medieval fuel systems. To the area that I'll be speaking about most today, Vanessa Brodka. 
Even before the geophysics, we knew that there was archaeology in this area, this rather wonderful stone, which is now in the National Museum in Edinburgh. It was found back in the 1920s, and it was described as being found in association with some uh, conjoined kists. But you can see these beautiful bands of incised decoration, very reminiscent of what you'll find in grooved ware pottery. But what the geophysics showed was, in fact, a whole array of different anomalies, rectangular ones, oval ones, linear ones, concentric ones, a whole host of things. But I don't think, when we saw the results initially, could anybody have guessed that all of these are associated with the World Heritage Site and are all Neolithic in date. It wasn't, though, until 2003 when we had the chance to actually ground truth some of these when uh, a large stone slab turned up in Glasgow University under the human remains call-off contract were called in. But instead of finding a uh, Bronze Age kist as suspected, what they in fact uncovered was this beautiful bit of walling. There you see these two people excavating inside of what we presumed was a Neolithic house. It's very kind of angular architecture, very reminiscent of structure to a barn house. The following year, we uh, decided to put a series of test trenches across the whole mound. One, primarily to investigate the agricultural damage that was potentially being done to the site, but also to try to get a handle on what this meant. And although we positioned all the small test pits away from the major geophysical anomalies, in every single one we uncovered the remains of structural archaeology. And what this seemed to indicate was that this large mound, which is over 250 metres long, 100 metres wide, and about 4 metres high, is archaeology, and all Neolithic archaeology. Since then, our trenches have got just a little bit bigger. But this is still less than 10% of the site. So what's there for future generations of archaeology? And what we've uncovered is a Neolithic complex which I don't think can be paralleled anywhere else. In the latter phases that we've so far looked at, you're looking at a site which is dominated by several very large stone structures. At least three just within our trench and many more indicated by the geophysics. And the preservation is quite outstanding. Here are just a few examples. Structure 1, which in its primary form was very much like structure 2 at Hot Bar House. Six recesses arranged around probably what we expect to be a uh, double uh, path area. But this has been later transformed by the insertion of this massive curving wall. And later on, a strange circular structure built within this building. Structure 8, very similar to structure 1, with these uh, stone piers creating recesses along the wall faces. And this was based on what appears to be an earlier oval structure that we're just coming to terms with. But it's, in its main form, you're looking at a structure which is probably in excess of 20 metres long and uh, almost 10 metres wide. And within this structure, we've had some quite amazing finds. Not least, perhaps, is the discovery of what appears to be a standardised Neolithic roofing system. These slabs here are Neolithic slates, very like the ones you might see on many Arcadian roofs even today. A lot of these have been trimmed into rectangular shapes of a, maybe a standardised form. No sign of kind of nail holes or anything, but... I think undoubtedly the remains of a collapsed roof. And in association with this structure, again, there's it to emphasise the perhaps an abnormal uh, function of this. There's an amazing array of finds here, just from two of the uh, side recesses that we've so far managed to get down to the floor deposits on whalebone, uh, mattocks, a uh, vast array of uh, polished stone tools, uh, mace heads, etc. And last year to uh, join structures 1 and 8 is structure 12. Again, very similar for these side recesses created by these beautifully 
tapered stone piers. Interesting to note also that in all these three structures, the distances between these piers is a standard roughly four metres. I'm not saying megalithic yards. The development of the site, though, is, uh, again, quite amazing. When these structures had gone out of use, what they're su uh, supplanted with is Structure 10, which uh, really dwarfs everything else on site in both its scale and complexity. And the closest parallel we have to it is probably Structure 8 at Barn House. But in its... Uh, main life, you're looking at a structure with a cruciform shaped central chamber, walls five metres thick, entranceway somewhere in this region we think, and an outer forecourt annex. But note the uh, cruciform shape of the central chamber, very reminiscent of uh, what you'll see at uh, Mays Howe with the, the central chamber there, and also surrounded by a paved walkway running all the way around it. The similarities of the shape of the central chamber of uh, structure 10 in Mays Howe is also reflected in the use of standing stones. Here at Mays Howe we have standing stones creating the corner buttresses and also it's been argued that the large stone slabs forming the entrance passage are part of a dismantled stone circle. Well, with structure 10 we also have standing stones. Here the remains of one in the annex area made from rhyolite, very hard igneous rock, and with this hole drilled through it. <coughs> but not just one old standing stone hints that another one stood somewhere close by, this fragment that was uh, recovered from the uh, debris within the structure. This association with Mays Howe is also perhaps most dramatically uh, shown by the orientation of Structure 10, when you draw a line down the central axis of the building, Lo and behold, in the dissidents, Maze Howe. But this kind of association with a funerary monument, um, there's other things which would seem to connect Structure 10 with the domestic. Because here in the central chamber that we're just getting down onto the main floor deposits, you also have a large square half, recesses around the side, which you might see more normally in some of the houses, perhaps of Scarabray. But and also a stone dresser. But this stone dresser is something, again, quite unusual. A lot of the stone has been dressed. This slab, in fact, has pet chevron designs along the, the edge. And also, this cup and ring mark stone came from debris just behind the dresser. Tempting to see this as perhaps being set into the back of the dresser. And the equinox sun may be shining down the entrance passage and lighting this up. Maybe a bit too poetic. I'm not sure. But um, also Structure 10, an amazing array of Neolithic art. Lots of examples of cut mark stones. Here, for example, one, a beautiful one, set into the entrance passage. And this use of art is reflected by a wide range of art right the way across the site. We now have something like 120 examples from that very large cup and ring peg marks to much more finely incised. This is part of a large chevron design. Well, this one, very similar to the uh, original Baragda stone discovered in the 1920s. But it's not just the use of Structure 10 which is unusual. It's also the apparent decommissioning of it when the paved pathway that runs all the way around the structure was infilled with an animal bone deposit. But not just any animal bone deposit. Uh, it's all cattle, or about 95% of it's cattle. But not just any cattle bone, it's all cattle tibia. And in the small area that uh, here we see Dr. Ingrid Mainland excavating last year, about a square metre, uh, she, remained, uh, she recovered the remains of 14 individual cattle. So when you multiply that up, this bone deposit that does run all the way around the structure perhaps represents the remains of hundreds of cattle. Final feast? Who knows? In Structure 10, we also have the use of coloured sandstone, much as you'll see 
those who've been to Orkney, as you see at uh, St Magnus's Cathedral in Kirkwall. And this, again, has been brought in from several kilometres distance. And to complement the use of coloured sandstone within Structure 10, this year we also found the remains of Neolithic paint. Uh, I can't remember what I said to the student who discovered this when she came running over to me and said, I've discovered painted walls, but I think uh, I didn't believe her. But lo and behold, here on one of the slabs built into Structure 8, the slab with uh, definitely bands of uh, coloured pigment, reds. This photograph doesn't really do it justice, but reds, browns, ochres, yellows, you know, all kind of lovely earthy colours. And uh, later on, again in Structure 8, this, which doesn't really show up too well, but a kind of chevron design that has been painted on. To complement these structures and the uh, discoveries I've shown already, also a lovely array of beautiful finds, stone axes, mace heads, pitch stone from Aaron. Most of the flint assemblage seems to have been made from flint from the Yorkshire Wolds. A very large array of grooved ware pottery. Uh, in all my years of excavating in Orkney, I've never seen uh, such a, a wide range of pottery, pottery decoration, which perhaps could represent uh, input from lots of different communities right the way across the islands. But perhaps most amazing to me is what contained these structures. At the northern side of the Nessa Brodga, we discovered what somebody called the Great Wall of Brodga, but a wall of truly monumental dimensions. In its initial uh, form, over four metres wide, with an outer ditch, but in a later phase, made even wider, six metres wide. And this has now been traced all the way across the peninsula separating the major structures here from the Ring of Brodga to the north. And we did think that maybe this was some form of symbolic barrier separating the activity or maybe a lack of activity around the Ring of Brodga from what was happening at the Ness. Perhaps as Mike Parker Pearson has suggested that separating the land of the living from the land of the dead. And this is reflected also by the dike of Seen, which seems to form the northern boundary of this kind of dead zone around the Ring of Brodga, a large earthwork that kind of stretches across the Brodga Peninsula, here seen from a uh, Royal Commission photograph running right the way across. And this is, or has in the past, been always thought of as a medieval uh, parish boundary, but just last year some cows in the field very kindly exposed that a section of it, and there we have uh, some truly monumental stonework, and if that's not Neolithic, um, I think I'll give up archaeology. But two years ago, we also opened a trench over a linear anomaly that seemed to define the southern edge of the, uh, the Ness, and there we discovered a wall, which although slightly smaller in its scale, it's only two metres thick. It's now been exposed to height of uh, almost 1.8 metres. And this, again, seems to run right the way across the, uh, the peninsula, perhaps forming some form of enclosure, walled enclosure around the major structures on site. So what was the Nessa Brodga? Uh, please forgive these, uh, perhaps, uh, slight exaggerations. But I wouldn't be at all surprised when we actually get down to the floor deposits in these buildings that we're looking at something really out with the domestic sphere. Uh, temple precinct, pilgrimage site, tribal meeting place, the list really goes on and on. Lots of theories flying around. And uh, whatever it was, I think the Nessa Brodga really uh, seems to link all these other monuments, almost the, the kind of keystone and perhaps even brings into question the kind of presidency of these known sites, which in some ways have so coloured our 21st century vision of the landscape. And as this early print of Vanessa shows, perhaps Vanessa was the kind of prime focus 
of the Neolithic landscape. So I hope that you know the work that we've been doing is beginning to draw all these different strands together. And perhaps as is happening at the, uh, the Stonehenge Riverside project, we're looking at not just a landscape of isolated monuments, almost divorced from the landscape setting, but an integrated ritual landscape. Thank you very much.